Okay, so I think we should go. Uh, good morning. Good morning, fellow electron microscopists in California, USA, and internationally across the globe. My name is Bob Sinclair, and I am uh, one of the co-organizers of this new EMX symposium series. I'd like to thank my uh, co-organizers, Hua Chu, Jen Dion, and uh, particularly Yi Che, whose uh, original idea it was to have a symposium like this. And of course, uh, most of all, our uh, graduate students, Zi Wen and Raphael, who have been remarkable in putting all of this together. So as you know, this is a period when travel is completely restricted and uh, Zoom meetings have taken their place. And so we thought uh, this was an opportunity for uh, us all to hear uh, people who are eminent in the field of electron microscopy to talk about significant breakthroughs. And that this could be a, a, a forum uh, to provide this sort of information. And perhaps uh, even more so, there are many researchers who work on, in our field and do not have the opportunity to attend conferences and experience these types of talks. And perhaps there's a, uh, an opportunity then for us to provide this sort of information. We are a university and our main goal is to educate students and to propagate knowledge. And uh, this will be the level at which uh, the talks will be given. So we will attempt to, to do this, and it's our plan to do this uh, once a month on the first Mondays of the month. And uh, hopefully this will fill a uh, current void in our communications with each other. And perhaps uh, it might even be longer lasting when normality, whatever that may be, uh, will return. My role today is just to introduce this series, which will highlight developments in both uh, bio TEM and physical science TEM. Today's theme is the development of cryo-electron microscopy in both the biological and now the material science fields. And uh, we have two extremely distinguished speakers to start us off. So the first talk will be moderated by Hua Chu and is given by Professor Jacques Duboucher. And the second talk will be moderated by Jen Dion and uh, Professor Yi Che, uh, who gave the m, m plenary talk this year, will tell us about use of cryo for batteries. So what I need to do now is just hand the baton over to uh, Hua Chu and we've known each other since our Berkeley days in the 1970s, so it's a great, uh, uh, great honor to be uh, working with him uh, on this symposium. And so, Wa, if you would kindly introduce our first speaker and yourself, of course, and uh, let's get uh, this show on the road. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, everyone who attend this meeting. It's my distinct pleasure to work with my colleagues in material science to organize this series of symposiums. And today we are particularly privileged to have Professor Jacques Dubouchet from University of Lausanne, who is the 2017 Nobel laureate in chemistry. I know Jacques when he had his uh, uh, work uh, at uh, EMBL in Heidelberg some years ago. Over there, he started a really key experiment, which would transform the whole field of electron microscopy. And he would today tell us about the account of how his discovery was originated and also give us his perspective on a Nobel Prize, how and what for. It's my distinct pleasure to present to you, Professor Jacques Dubuchet. Jacques. It's all yours. 
Hello, everybody. Ah. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with Wah also. We know each other since a very long time, about as long as he knows Bob Sinclair. And uh, it's a very strange impression to be here now in California. Gosh, one day before your tremendously important election, two or three days before your country is going to be officially out of the Paris Agreement. Oh, la, 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 that's an important day. And I will tell you about which I oh. Oh, 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 have you seen that? Doesn't work. Uh, how do I get to the next? Oh. Uh, it's an arrow in, are uh, you just to a return in your keyboard? Yes, probably this. Yeah, that would work too. Yes. Why cryo electron microscopy? Because you and I, I, we are all made out of water, mostly water and a little bit of other things, but water evaporates in the vacuum of the electron microscope and therefore for 50 years, electron microscopes of water and this is a great pity. You see, this is a tough virus, a T4, and this is this one has been drawn it has dried on a supporting film and the poor virus is not elegant now people as very smart people and uh, as develop various method to try to preserve nevertheless a little bit the structure for example the famous negative staining where you keep the structure surrounding with heavy metals or lyophilization, freeze drying, uh, like that. That's very nice. At that time, it was a long time ago, uh, my hero was Nigel Unwin. And he thought that this heavy metal salt to keep living matter biological matter healthy is certainly not a good idea. He should embed the material into sugar. <laughs> and with that, he joined the force with another person, Richard Henderson, and together they got the first molecular structure of a, of a molecule, the bacterial rhodopsin. This was 1975, and I was very, very impressed by those two persons. Uh, three years later, I was appointed by, by um, John Kendrew, the director of the very recently founded electron microscope, uh, sorry, UMBL, European Molecular Biology Laboratory. And uh, the idea of Kendrew was simple. He had a number, about 20 young uh, scientists uh, with ambitious project and give us an in perfect condition to be creative and with the benediction of him to be creative and to go ahead. My project was quite ambitious, cryo-electron microscopy of hydrated specimen using, using a low temperature to keep the water in the specimen. This, this idea is, is not very sophisticated and it was performed before by several people including Bob Glazer in Berkeley and um, I was coming with a trying uh, of to, to revisit the problem, the question. The problem as you know is that uh, cold water is ice and ice is about as bad as no water uh, then uh, voila. So we try to freeze and to cool by all kinds of means uh, using all our possible idea to find, find something different. And so we had this extremely sophisticated machine. Don't laugh, be respectful. You will see it if you go to Stockholm and visit the Nobel Museum. And the machine is, is go, going like that. 
On the right side, there is a nebulizer throwing very, very small droplets of water through the slit. And you have this tweezer. And I don't think I show, yes, perhaps. This tweezer here, do you see the, the arrow? No, no, doesn't matter. Um, and the twe at the end of the tweezer, there is a specimen uh, with, a, on a, with a supporting film. And you just let the tweezer fall down in liquid nitrogen and some, some drop of water are taken on the way and you get things like that. And this is a very interesting uh, ice uh, water droplet, nicely frozen. If you look carefully, you can see that freezing start at the top of the, the drop, then develop to the bottom. Oh, yes, it's very interesting indeed. And um, my apparatus had the idea to make a small change. He put a beaker in the, on the middle of the uh, dewar and he condensed liquid ethane in the beaker so that uh, the, the tweezer for the grid fall in liquid ethane instead of liquid nitrogen. And then he called me to the microscope because this was to be seen in the microscope. And uh, we were, well, we didn't know what this could be. Was it uh, liquid uh, frozen ethane or what? No, it could not be ethane because at that temperature, minus 170 uh, ethane would be gone. So we thought, okay, we will see how this stuff evaporates. So we stop cooling and, the, and the, let the specimen older warm slowly. It took about half, a part of an hour, a bit more. And after that time, it didn't evaporate. But suddenly, in a second, it transformed into a multiple crystal, a polycrystal that we could immediately identify by electron diffraction. It was cubic ice. And so if you get ice from something which is amorphous, you have, you have, you have found how to obtain vitreous water. And so I said to my colleague, Alastair, ho, 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 we have a big thing here. Indeed, well, voila, here's Alastair. He is now semi-retired from, from California. He's a colleague of you. And um, voila. Uh, by the way, I got a Nobel Prize because of that to a large extent. And he didn't got the Nobel Prize. Voila. I, leave you with a uh, thought on that. Um, and so we sent this discovery to nature and immediate, uh, soon after uh, we had this remarkable reply, you can't bend nature because it was very well known that vitrification was fundamentally impossible. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, well, nature was doubly wrong because why? We submitted our paper. They had in press, no, in, yes, in press, uh, this paper by Brueggel and Meyer from, from Austria, complete vitrification in pure liquid water and dilute aqueous solution. Therefore, we were not the first, doesn't matter. Vitrification is possible and uh, uh, we published that later, but the most important thing was to make something out of it. Uh, yes, the, the, so that we, we have prepare, uh, we could prepare a specimen with that. And this was another important discovery made by Marc Adrian. And you know, at that time in our lab, we were expert in spreading water or liquid things on a thin supporting film. And this is some fine surface property of the supporting film and of the liquid. And Mark didn't like that. So 
he prefer having no supporting film. And I explained to him that this is impossible. The surface and tough tension of water wants the water to be, to minimize its volume. So uh, spreading it in a, you know, uh, without support in a very, very thin film seems to be impossible. It is possible. And so sometime ago, sometime later, Mark came with this kind of thing. This is a pure uh, film of vitreous water, nothing else than virus, vitreous water or vitreous solution, and nothing else. The ideal specimen indeed. Well, you know, it's how it goes. It's quite simple. You put the drop on the grid, you come with a blotting paper, you press with the on the blotting paper on the grid. It takes about one second so that all the grid goes into the blotting paper, not quite all, the last tenth of a mic, but that's another story. But um, well, from time to time, I get a message that the communication is not good. I hope you can see and hear me. Um, okay, so this is falling down and that's, well, this is, voila, you understand. Of course you understand that because you are practicing that every day or so. And uh, in 1984, we had this publication, great success. Two years later, we had the reconstruction of the semiliquiferous virus with Steve Provence and Fogel. And uh, this was at third later, the people of X-ray who who likes to speak about atoms were laughing at us and they spoke, spoke about blobology and they were very right. But a lot of people joined the effort. Uh, among those, two of them that we cannot miss, Joachim Frank, who was working on the ribosomes and who developed the capability to reconstruct in three dimension the immensely complex ribosomes by in cryo -AM. And Richard Anderson is, I think, the, the best of us, of, of all of us, because from the very beginning, he knew where to go. And, 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 and where, where sh should we go? Of course, we should improve the resolution so that we go to atomic resolution. And this was, it took 35 years. And after 35 years, it was around 2015, we were routinely, not so much. I was not an important person in that. A lot of those two were much more important for that. But in any case, we came to atomic resolution. And when you are at atomic resolution, you speak about chemistry. And that's the reason why the people in Stockholm decide that this is important and that we should have a Nobel Prize. Great. Thank you very much. But this is the moment when things get complicated. I think it was the 4th of October and I got the phone call that there is this Nobel Prize. And uh, at the, the 8th of December, I had to give a talk to the world that in Stockholm. Oof. And I was very nervous of that. And during this two and a half more, two months and a few days, I became more and more nervous. What shall I do with this? Shall I speak about cold water? Of course, I have to speak about cold water, but shall I speak only about cold water? No, 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 it's not possible. You have to tell, you have to speak about important thing. So I spoke about, about knowledge, about the fact that we are very good in producing knowledge, we scientists, but the world is not good at using it. And we should, and we, 
we, we should fight that knowledge is and remain a common good used for the well-being of all. And then I finish my little talk by I was extremely nervous and um, it makes a, gave a strong impression. And since that time, I call that my coming out. I was before, I was always politically active. I, I wanted the world to go as better as possible. and so but but you see when you get speak people believe that you are intelligent and that you say the truth and of course i'm not different at all after the, all that that i should do this and i had it and it was quite easy because it was the time when well the climate was i was very nervous on the problem of climate and preservation of life and when I heard, um, when I, oh, why, yeah, 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 yeah. no, I will jump on that. Sorry. And, um, are we, sorry, I missed my, I, I have to come back to this. So I was extremely nervous about the problem of climate. And I'm sure you know all what it's about. It's, I'm not sure, but nevertheless, it's good to remember what it is about. And the show you this image, which is this chart, which is the temperature anomaly since a long time. And you see how the temperature on Earth is now growing, uh, increasing in a very, very remarkable way. Uh, we are scientists, when we get a curve like that, we want to understand what's going on. What is the rule beside which make these this things happen? And the method, our good method, when we see such a growing curve, curve is to test, is it an exponential? And if it's an exponential, then we have to put it in semi-logarithmic plot. And the same data as here are put in semi-logarithmic plot. And you notice that the, the anomal temperature anomaly is a remarkable exponential growth. It's a very continuous, sustained um, uh, exponential growth, doubling every 30, 28, or 30 years. And this happens so already three, nearly three times since the beginning we can measure it correctly. And of course, this means if we don't change, and we have not changed now since 60 years, and there is no reason to be, believe we have changed anything. It's not what we have changed the last few years which has changed anything. It's just continuing like that now. And it's not going to change very rapidly unless we do something very important. And you see, it's going to continue. And this means the famous 1.5 degrees that we would like not to, to go beyond. This is for 2030. And the famous two degree, which are thought to be the total, the limit which the, our society can support, this is for 2040. And if we continue like that, we have eight degree at the end of the century when my grandchild will have my age. Eight degree, eight degrees crazy. You can't, you will have, you will forget about United States. You will have a nice little, zone of temperate in Canada and in Siberia, 
very little in the in uh, in South America, and for the rest, it will be unlivable for our for our kind of society. Oops. So there is a problem, and um, I was very very touched when Greta Thunberg at um, Kratowicz in Poland on December 18 at the 24th uh, conference on climate said this. You, she was, she was, uh, that time she was, uh, how much, uh, 16, yes. You only speak of a green eternal economic growth because you are too scared of being unpopular. You only talk about moving forward with the same bad idea that got us into this mess, even when the only sensible thing to do is pull the emergency brake. You are not mature enough to tell it like it is. Even that burden, you leave it to us children. Whoop, that's impressive. And so, and I noticed that a group of young people of my canton was there in Kratowicz and I knew some of them. And so I became acquainted with these people of this young, this, this uh, cl climate strike people. And I, well, I, I, I became, a and they, since I have such a voice, they used me and I used them and uh, we became in close relationship. And uh, well, well, you see, I, I became a person, uh, an active person in this field. I work with Greta also here with the father. I was uh, the, the, the newspaper made a lot of noise around that. And, 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 um, and, and not only the newspaper, but in fact, the, gov the, 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 the government, our politician were also uh, moved. And indeed, things are moving in our region. And, um, but there is a lot more to do. And perhaps, and if you are not yet active in this field, please become, join the effort it's our future. I see a young child here with Jan Dion. Hey, for all of us, but for our children, we have to do that. Thank you very much. That's enough for me. Thanks very much, Sark, uh, for these uh, really stimulating lectures. And um, you definitely have uh, account for the past and, uh, and also put a path for us in the future. Uh, now, uh, Chuck would be willing to entertain some questions. For those who like to ask questions, please write down your questions in Q&A and I'll read out the questions to Chuck and he would respond. Why I'm waiting for uh, people to raise the question. Jack, can I ask you about a, a, um, a perspective question? Some years ago, uh, you have thought about doing these cryomycoscopy at cellular levels. And I remember you spent quite a bit of time devoted in developing that technology. I would yes. like to hear what is your perspective uh, in the future? Yes, we call that Senovis yes. cryoelectron nanoscope, uh, nanoscopy of cry of vitreous, vitreous section, and of course the idea is simple. You take a piece of you of me, you small enough so that you can vitrify it. Well, 
We know it's very difficult to vitrify anything as large as one micron, but you can put perhaps a very little bit of cryoprotectant. And the, 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 the nature of, of, of biological matter is also a little bit cryoprotective. So you can make perhaps, you can vitrify perhaps with a layer of 10 micrometer or 20 or 100 micrometer if you do it under adequate condition. And then you make thin section, 100, 100 nanometer section, and you reconstruct the cell at atomic di dimension. Uh, it doesn't, it, it works a little bit, but it's, it's quite diff it's difficult. And I think that cryo-electron microscopy of vitreous samples, the vitreous specimen of molecule is working so well and it's so easy that people has, have forgotten about the difficulty of some of this. And there is also an alternative. Instead of cutting with a knife, you cut with an with a iron beam. And uh, personally, I think that it, it would be very worthwhile to continue with Senovist because uh, there are so, so subtle progress on what is gliding, what is um, the, the physic of gliding between two surfaces is progressing so much and there are so subtle things, I'm sure that there is there, there are things to be explored. Who knows? Perhaps once, perhaps because it's a difficult thing. Because it's it's not it's 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 you don't know what is the path, and perhaps there is a, a nice Nobel Prize at the end. Okay, so that means there's another prospects in the future in in integrating the material science or mechanical engineering knowledge to develop the next generations of. Uh, uh, cutting device to preserve the cellular material. That sounds really nice. So there are some questions from the audience. Uh, one of the questions is, is there any possibility for the Nobel Prize who, for, the, for those who invented the abrasion yet on microscopy? Any possibility of what? Of, uh, of, uh, of awarding a Nobel Prize uh, for individual who invented the aberration Yechon microscope. Yechon microscope with aberration corrector. You see, ah, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I have a problem here with my telephone. Well, that's over. Poof. I was very surprised when I got a Nobel Prize. I will not be able to say who should get one. Okay. All right. Good. That's a good answers. And uh, another question uh, raised is, what do you think the quality of the current PhD students globally? Well, I'm, I know, ah, um, I don't know about the, doctoral student in United States. Uh, since I've lost contact uh, since several years because I do not travel by, by plan and um, I'm not fit enough to travel by boat, <laughs> by sailing boat. But um, in Europe, there is a problem. You see, when I was hired by Kendrew, and before, during my PhD by Kellenberg, I had an enormous freedom and my, my, my boss were just expecting me to find something they have not thought of. And um, I'm afraid that, you, well, it's something quite important that, because no, in most case, when you are, you make you are researching something, you have an idea, and you spend all your effort to prove that your idea is right and that and to push it forward. But you see what happened to us. It's the contrary. We were trying all kinds of things, and suddenly we found something which should not have been. 
And this is, of course, much more interesting than just controlling and proving that what you have, everybody knows is, uh, is correct and even a bit more correct than they thought before. This is what happened at the CERN and where in the CERN in 30 years, they are proving year after year that what they said 40 years ago is correct. That's boring. Right. Good. So another question related to the time that you were EMBL, the crystallography was at its peak. And what was the driving force you uh, decided you want to do this cryo yetron microscopy, even though with these uh, great advances in crystallography? Well, at that time, that's a nice question. But at that time, you see, I was not thinking about atomic resolution. I was thinking of uh, having a, the, knowing that water is important and having water kept in the sample, uh, being convinced that this would be better. And uh, it was, it's, it, that's the reason why I always insist on the contribution of uh, Richard Henderson, because for the beginning, and indeed before, he knew that we have, he is a crystal, Henderson is a crystallograph. And he has atomic resolution in his mind. I came very slowly to that. Right. Okay, another question from the audience is, what is your best advice for individuals who just begin to embark a career in electron microscopy? Yes, I... I, <laughs> I already answered a little bit. You know, there is this nice joke of um, the guy who lost his key and uh, is looking on the, in, the, in the night and he's looking under the traffic, on the, under the street light to find it back, to find it. And people came to help him. And after a long while, uh, people told him, but are you sure you lost it here? No, 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 it's on the meadow there, but there, there is no chance to find it, there is no light. And uh, um, people tend to, to build their research around questions which are own, and the, 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 the avenue is already written. And so you just have to, to follow the avenue. No, try to find something else. Try to find something where people thought, woof, boof, voila. Okay, good. Another question is, uh, how can the Yetra microscopy use our technical skill to help the, the climate change agenda? <laughs> well, we will listen to the next seminar and um, we will see how physics, pure physics, can help in, in the question of energy and so far and so forth. Um, I think I would see the thing differently. I don't mind if electron microscopy will help solving our energy or climate problem. Uh, you see, I am not a climatologist. I am just an honest citizen with some education. And I think that as a, uh, not only an honest citizen, but an honest scientist. And I think that as scientists, we have a powerful method. We stick to, the na to nature, to fact. And in the present time, it's very important. And we have a very important duty to, to insist on the value of reality. 
Yes, you probably know that even better than, than uh, well, every, everybody speaks about what's going on in the state with, with alternative reality. Woo! Okay. We have, we have, a, we have to be scientists. Okay. Uh, by the way, what is a scientist? For many people, a scientist is a person who is arrogant and believes to know everything. And no, no. My definition is a scientist is the person whose only master is nature. Sounds good. Modestly. Okay, I, in the interest of time, I have one more question. Uh, since scientific research always involves collaborations uh, of individuals from different lab or sometimes uh, across the continent, uh, how do you envision doing this collaborative research, uh, which is compatible with climate change friendliness? Because we have to travel, that means we may kind of mess up the climate again. And so how do we compromise that? Well, you see, um, I feel now in the uh, United States, in California. Um, bon, I think it's important that I have been once or several times in California. And I think that every young people should have the right and the duty to discover the world. But I think that we who already have seen everything, we could quietly forget this very long travel. At least it's about now 10 years that I have given up this. Okay, good. Thanks very much for this. And I would like to conclude to thank uh, Sark for this uh, very perspective uh, and conceptive uh, lectures and I enjoy very much indeed and I hope all of you who attend these uh, talks also likewise. Let's uh, so give a, a, a kind of hands. Thank, Thank you, you very much. for listening and be patient with my excitation. Yeah, it's perfect so far. Okay, I turn the floor back to uh, Professor Sinclair. Great, thank you. Well, thank you, Jacques, for a very stimulating <laughs> opening to our seminar series. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we can find a way to send uh, more of the questions to you. And uh, I'm sure you'll be happy to address them uh, to people who are coming, asking questions from all, all over the, uh, the globe internationally, uh, as well as in Switzerland and America. So uh, I think uh, Jen Dion, uh, we'll introduce uh, uh, Yi, the next speaker. Uh, is Jen there, please? Yeah, thank you so much, Bob. And uh, thank you, Jock, for the uh, amazing opening talk. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Yi Shui of Material Science and Engineering at Stanford. Yi received his bachelor's degree in chemistry at the University of Science and Technology in China, or USTC, in 2002 before um, his BS and his PhD rather, before starting as a uh, postdoc at Harvard University where he worked with um, Charlie Liebern. Or oh, rather, PhD at Harvard. Um, sorry, our, our kids are in the background, so I was distracted for a second. And then he did his um, PhD at um, Harvard and his postdoc as a Miller Fellow um, at the University of California, Berkeley. He started at Stanford in 2005 and was promoted to tenure in 2010. He's published over 500 research papers and has an impressive H index of over 204. In 2014, he was ranked number one in material science by Thomson Reuters as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. He's a fellow of the MRS Society, the Electrochemical Society, and the Royal Society of Chemistry, and also an executive editor of Nano Letters. He's been selected to receive the MRS Medal, which he received in 2020, the ECS Battery Technology Award in 2019, the Blantnevik National Laureate Award in 2017, and a Sloan Research Fellowship in 2010, among many other impressive awards. 
He's also extremely entrepreneurial and has founded four companies to commercialize various technologies from his lab, including Amprius, 4C Air, Inc., and Innovate. I met Yi when I was a postdoc um, at, at Berkeley, and he was doing some extremely impressive battery work at the time. And since I started at Stanford, his lab and, and mine have both gone into electron microscopy. And I believe Yi is um, among the first, if not the first person to apply cryo electron microscopy to energy problems and to battery problems. So I think his talk is a perfect way to segue from some of the questions about how electron microscopy can influence um, positively uh, climate change. So without further ado, I'll hand over the floor to Yi. Thank you so much for speaking today. Thank you, Jen, uh, for the very nice introduction. Uh, and also uh, thank you, Bob and Bob. You arranged my talk right after Professor Dubache is a perfect order right there. Uh, some of the audience asked the question about how electron microscopy cryo can help addressing the climate change issue. This will be the topic I'm going to talk about today. Um, so let me um, start by just saying, uh, and to solve the climate change, to have clean energy right there, materials-based technologies, very important. I'm listing some of the uh, possibility right here. The batteries, we all know it's very important to power the electrical car. Metal organic framework to store CO2 gas absorption and also doing catalysis, the also general electrocatalysis. These materials uh, together with perovskite solar cells, a nano and organic interface, they are very, very dynamic. Atoms move around, ions move, move around, molecules coming in and going out. And then in the same time, you need electrons. And they're dynamic, but they're fragile. How do you really understand down to atomic scale resolution uh, what these materials are doing? So this is really the central question we try to address uh, in our lab using the uh, cryo EM and, and also in situ uh, TEM. Um, and let me just use mostly example from the batteries to share with you the power of electron microscopy to solve this problem. Of course, we know it, uh, uh, batteries are important for electronics, consuming electronics now to power the electrical vehicles and as well as allow you to think about integrate solar and wind electricity into the electrical grid. The battery can offer a solution in doing so. So these are all very important. So we have seen in the past, uh, in the last year, right, the Nobel Prize was given to uh, these three gentlemen for the development of the lithium ion batteries. So uh, the Nobel Committee have seen the power of battery to power you know, the green energy. And the basic idea of lithium ion batteries is use material store lithium. You have a negative electrode store lithium in the low potential. Having another material to store lithium in the high, higher potential, then you can build a full cell of the batteries right there. Uh, so we asked the question, and long before indeed the Nobel Prize uh, recognized this contribution is, you know, the lithium ion batteries was invented if you date it back in the 1970s and 80s. And what are the remaining challenges we want to uh, address? First of all is uh, how much more energy we can put into the batteries per unit weight or per unit volume. And can we extend the battery life much longer in both cycle life and calendar life going from let's say 3000 cycle to 10,000 cycles use it for 30 years. So these are not just a simple performance matrix. It looked back to the fundamental science, what's happening inside the materials, how the ions are moving, electrons are moving, and also how are they stored in these materials? And how fast can you charge all your batteries? Basically the speed of these uh, uh, ions and electrons moving and also the structure transformations right there taking place. Can we charge up the battery within 10 minutes? Can we make the batteries completely safe? And can we reduce the cost multiple times? 
how do you know the health condition inside the batteries? And all these atomic scale structure change, phase transformation, what determines the health condition of the batteries? And uh, what's the strategy for the battery reuse and recycle? At the end, what's the technology solution, the new chemistry materials for the grid scale and seasonal storage? This answering these questions is very important to help the green energy revolution. So just give you the very exciting example to answer the question, you know, how do we store lithium? How do we store ions? How much more can you store? Can we store right there? This is the plot of my uh, previous graduate student, Ya Yuan, now a postdoc at MIT, uh, helped to plot in this reveal paper. And vertical axis is the relative volume change. Horizontal axis is the ions you store, in this case, lithium, versus your host material's atomic ratio. The Nobel Prize winning materials is this type of material, lithium graphite, right? Graphite store six atoms, uh, carbon atoms store one lithium, lithium cobalt oxide, about five atoms, cobalt oxygen store one lithium. Lithium ion phosphate in this case is about six to store one. So we spent about 40 years to learn about how to use about six atoms to store one lithium ion. In order to store a lot more energy, we need to increase the amount of lithium ion storage. Then this lithium to host atom ratio will go up. And then the new materials are needed. For example, like lithium sulfide. Right? Sulfur store, one sulfur store two lithium. Lithium oxide, one oxygen stores two lithium. And then once you move to silicon, one silicon can store 4.4 lithium. It's a lot more. And metallic lithium doesn't even need a hose. It's just a plating and stripping. However, this relative volume change increased tremendously. We just didn't know how to handle these materials. We need to understand what's happening inside these materials in order to overcome this volume expansion. So the past 30 years of commercialization of lithium ion batteries is built on the stable hose. And what about the new materials coming in? you start to deal with chemical bond breaking, host atoms move to long distance, complete structure change, huge volume expansion 10 times or more. And uh, there will be a paradigm shift in the material design to handle all this problem. And the atomic scale, you care about reversibility, individual partic particle scale, you care about volume expansion of particles and their interface stability. Here, SER is a solid electron interface. That's an interface between your particle and your organic electrolyte and the whole electrolyte level of volume expansion and breaking. If we learn how to enable the new material, we have a possibility at the bottom is right now where the technology is per kilogram of the battery is 250 watt hour. That's a unit to really uh, to for uh, the energy density of the batteries at this moment, and roughly in the Tesla car. And can we go to 400, 500 or even higher? If you use new materials coming in, such as silicon anode to replace graphite, metallic lithium anode coming in, having sulfur cathode coming, coming in. So this is becoming super exciting to enable you know, much longer driving range. Your energy density is higher for given weight or given volume of the battery pack. You store a lot more energy. Instead of 250 miles driving range, you can go up to 500 miles of driving range. So that becomes a super exciting for us to, to work on. So let me use a silicon as an example. Graphite was used a, as an anode before, like for a, the past 30 years in commercial space. What about silicon? Silicon store about 11 times charge storage capacity compared to graphite. However, silicon volume expansion is four times. It will generate this breaking problem. And then not only the material is broken, you cannot build a stable interface right there. These uh, anno materials will decompose organic electrolyte forming so-called cell decomposition compound, SEI, solid electrolyte interface. With this volume expansion with lithium coming in, that's lithium going out. And uh, if it's, it's going to shrink, you don't have a stable interface right there. So the interface will be broken as well. So to really solve this problem, 
in 2008, uh, I was hired into Stanford in 2005. At the time, Bob Sinclair was the department chair. Well, I coming into Stanford uh, without knowing I'm going to work on batteries, but uh, I decided on spot, you know, uh, to uh, start a, a project. In 2008, January, we published this paper. That is uh, start to use nanoscience, nanomaterial design to solve the energy problem, to solve the energy storage problem. This is my first graduate student, Candice Chen. Um, I was telling Candice, I say, in order to solve the problem and going down to nano scale, we can avoid the breaking problem. Let's grow some silicon nanowire connected with current collector. You can ship electrons in and out and let the volume expansion taking place without breaking. Uh, that was an initial hypothesis. This turned out to be the paper to start a whole field of uh, nanoscience for uh, energy storage. Um, so let's see what's happening. And what's lithium coming into this structure? So I started to learn quite a bit of mechanics or, and also electron microscopy since this was also one of my early graduate students, Matt Madell and uh, my colleague Bill Nix, a mechanical expert in the department. So we started to adapt this in situ holder, the nano factory holder, and uh, among silicon nanowire to a gold pole, and the other side is lithium cobalt oxide, that's your cathode. The first experiment we did was to use ionic liquid with lithium salt in there. Then you apply a voltage, you drive the electrons coming in, lithium's coming in, and you start to let silicon react with lithium and watch what's happening and seeing all this volume expansion, whether it's breaking, phase transformation, this very rich phenomenon you could see. So that was also about a time uh, we uh, obtained a Titan microscope at Stanford, thanks to uh, uh, Bob's uh, leadership, bringing this environmental TEM uh, into Stanford. We started to do re research using this Titan. We can also put the particles of silicon in there. Well, let's see what's happening. This is a silicon nanowire coated with a copper uh, film on the surface. 200 nanometer scale bar right here. We speed up uh, multiple times. You, now let's see once lithium coming in, you could see this silicon volume expansion oh. takes place. And, uh, but silicon nanowire do not break. What's broken is the copper coating on the surface. Volume expansion happens so much, the copper get really broken. So that's exciting. We now see you know, nanostructure can hold on its structure without breaking. But we, but we really try to understand is there a phenomenon of a critical breaking size. Here, what you are seeing is 800 nanometer diameter particles in the middle, smaller ones surrounding it. What you are going to see is lithium coming in can break this middle one, 800 nanometer size particle, but very small one will not break. You see the volume expansion is taking place, crystal core shrink, the shell becomes amorphous lithium silicon. So now you see the breaking is taking place. If the material is broken, you are going to lose electrical contact between the materials. You cannot charge and discharge these batteries anymore. The batteries die right away. And uh, using a technique like this, we can identify what is the critical breaking size. Below this particle size, it that does not break anymore. It turned out to be 150 nanometers. With uh, Bill Nick's help, we actually analyze, you know, what type of stress level this really building up. This really accumulate up to about gigapascal type of level of stress, reaching this uh, breaking threshold and break this, uh, uh, this silicon. And nanowise critical breaking size close to more, close to, more close to 300 nanometer. There's details analysis of uh, how the stress is building up, giving the dimension of the structures. I won't go into detail of that. But this TEM study, the in situ study is very, very useful for us to, to identify these critical size parameters. Now these uh, size uh, parameters has been used to guide the whole industry what are the particle size we want to avoid the mechanical breaking? So uh, with the understanding and nan the approach of nanoscience, we have been through this 12 generation of design of a silicon from nanowire to core shell 
uh, and just just keep coming. We solve problem one by one. I will not go into the detail of that. This 12th generation present to the whole community, you know, what could be the idea to solve the problem of breaking instability of the interface. And the many research group actually jumping into this type of approach using nanomaterial design to solve the problem of high capacity, high energy density batteries. And in 2008, I founded a company, Empress, to commercialize the silicon anode technology. And Empress has the highest energy density battery now available in the market. And silicon graphite composite, that's uh, our production line one. Line two here in uh, Fremont, California, just right across the street from Tesla, Empress uh, headquarters, is a 430 watt per kilo, 1200 watt per liter. This is about 80% now more energy compared to the existing technology. I, I, I was very excited when Empress supplied the battery to Airbus Cyphers S, this commercial drone flying a, in a very high elevation, 25 days continuous flight time. Only the very high energy density batteries can power that. Uh, I hope this will be able to go into the electric car down the road very soon with large scale production coming in. So then, the silicon already working the holy grail of the batteries for the anode is really metallic lithium anode. If you look back in 1970s, when Stan Whittingham, the, one of the Nobel Prize winners in the last year for the lithium batteries, and at the time it was trying to make metallic lithium anode to work, you take a metallic lithium foil, you, you do the charging, you're going to deposit lithium onto this metallic lithium foil, However, there's no guarantee it's going to be the layer by layer deposition. You can cause the surface curvature change, break your solid electrolyte interface. This is the hot spot, huge lithium flux coming in, grow this dendrite. If you strip lithium away, you can strip from the bottom. This dendrite becomes the isolated lithium, lose electrical connection for the, from the underlying substrate. They are really the dead lithium right there. And oh, over cycles before long, the batteries actually lose capacities and then die. So we actually analyze this process. The root causes of the problem is high chemical reactivity of lithium. Together with building plating and stripping, you lose control of this volume expansion. So that caused many of the surrounding problems. West is the dendrite formation, side chemical reaction, batteries catching fire. So we need to solve this. In 2016, uh, in collaboration with Steve Chu, Kai Yan was uh, 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 our postdoc here. And we come up with an idea of using a host design. Metallic lithium is lacking a host materials right there. Why don't we design a host of a hollow carbon sphere about one micron in diameter inside? We put in this uh, seed, metallic seed particle, in this case it's gold but we could use other low cost metal. So once lithium deposition happened, based on the material science principle phase diagram, we figure out gold is a preferred nucleation seed to grow lithium metal inside, prevent lithium, outside, uh, lithium deposition from outside. Lithium ion can diffuse through this hollow carbon and really deposit inside. If we can make this structure, then we can have a stabilized lithium metal inside our host materials. We use nanoscale synthesis using a templated method to make this structure. I won't go into the detail of that. Now let me show you the TM image right there. This is a hollow carbon sphere close to about a micron in diameter with these black dots. Those are the gold nanoparticle seeds in there. And uh, these are the gold particle elemental mapping we can see. Uh, and now let's look at whether our hypothesis is right. Using this in situ cycling of uh, lithium deposition into this hollow carbon, we can see lithium coming in, gold get dissolved away by lithium. So lithium has solubility, you know, to dissolve so, uh, the capability to uh, 
to uh, dissolve gold away. Gold effectively function as a nucleation seed. They really like each other. So they can help making the deposition in there. But you can already see now under the TM electron beam, lithium metal is no longer solid. It, it's more like liquid. So this huge amount of energy dumping onto metallic lithium. Let me remind you, lithium's melting point is 100 about 180 degrees Celsius. So it's not a stable material. So this in situ TM for us to really understand if we take this hollow carbon particle, which goes sit in there as in the bottom case, we deposit lithium going in, they only go inside, they don't go outside. If you have hollow particle along, um, on the top case without the seat, lithium metal can deposit outside. The upper case, the top case is not stable. This has been guide, guiding our material design to come up better materials for this metallic lithium storage. So during this process, you know, I keep wondering how come we couldn't get atomic scale resolution of metallic lithium. So if we will look at this, uh, TM, you zoom in a little bit. This is regular TM at room temperature, right? This is in Titan. You are going to see this uh, metallic lithium dendrite will melt. Materials are gone. They're going to they diffuse away, they go somewhere else. So very challenging to obtain atomic scale resolution of imaging. This has been bothering me for a number of years. Is uh, what's the technique? We can look at the very sensitive being sensitive battery material as well as the solid electrolyte interface. So it wasn't until 2016, why if you remember you were, you, you were about to join in Stanford, before you join in, there's a lot of discussion already. I started to know about Wa's work, about cryo-EM. And uh, I still remember my uh, uh, postdoc time in Berkeley back in 2005 before moving to Stanford to join the faculty. I actually listened to a, a cryo EM uh, talk before in Berkeley and solving biology problem. If I remember correctly, the resolution at the time is about 10 angstrom and back in 2005. My memory probably is about right. So I was thinking, no, still not, not quite there yet. Then I forgot about the cryo EN, right? I, 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 until 2016, while was about to join the faculty. And then I start to see, oh my God, you know, cryo EM over the, about a decade long, already are the ones to about two angstrom resolution. I was so excited. And then I talked to two of my graduate students, Yu Zhang and Yan Bing. And I said, hi guys, I, I think I have a solution to, uh, to really get atomic scale resolution of sensitive material. Let's work on cryo. That's how I started to get into cryo. And, and you all know cryo is powerful from Professor Dubochet's talk, right? This is a 2017 Nobel Prize winning work. Well, let's look at the cryo. What's really the key things in cryo right there? Number one is freezing protocol or samples. Professor Dubosche already mentioned to you how he got the witch's eyes frozen. It's very important to freeze your sample, preserve your intrinsic state you want to look at. The second one is the, of course, direct electron detector becomes so important for you to use low dose before you destroy your sample. You can get the important images right there. The third thing for the bio, of course, is a lot of images you collected, thousands of them. How do you process those and get the information out. So we learn from this. And what's the key for the batteries? Number one thing extremely important is the sample preparation. We need to learn how to prepare the sample. If we adopt adopted approach, we actually develop invented this approach for the battery field is we take the TM grid, directly deposit metallic lithium filament right there. And uh, Yu Zhang and Yan Bing developed this uh, plunge freeze mechanism under argon. Make sure you don't expose to air. Lithium metal is so reactive. As soon as you expose to the air at room temperature, the whole thing changed. So you are going to see the artifact. Lithium metal is basically gone. And we immerse this into liquid nitrogen, plunge freeze that. And without exposed to, to air, we- Bonjour. We have this cryo transfer. Alors, attends, je suis en conférence maintenant. Know. 
Oh, je vous laisse. We file transfer technique oui. and we do, without oui. exposing aye, aye, aye. L, we transfer into the TM and uh and using this uh holder right this uh cold finger from cooling with liquid nitrogen maintain close to liquid nitrogen temperature maybe about 10 degrees celsius about liquid nitrogen temperature around that range uh insert that into our titan microscope here at stanford at the, at the time we didn't have uh, uh, uh as much access yet of a uh, uh, uh cryo em later is why we have a lot more access becomes more and more powerful. So to the left is the cryo EM image you see right away compared to the right hand side, top right, that's the standard TEM room temperature with one second air exposure. You look at the lithium dendrite, it's become black, the dark color. What's really telling you metallic lithium element number three React with air already become dark color. Lithium metal, it should be light contrast like what we seen to the lab, top lab. And then you only see the edge that's darker because air generating solid electron interface that's higher mass compared to the middle lithium metal. That's normal. We did the dose testing. Well, it turned out to be lithium metal is a lot more robust in the cryo condition compared to the biomolecule imaging lithium metal it's straightforward, it's a lot more easier. You know, lithium metal is metallic, melting point is 180 degrees Celsius. So to confirm it's metallic lithium, we did the ear spectrum, lithium K edge is really telling us that's metallic lithium, that's not ionic lithium. Well, and then under this uh, imaging condition, let me remind you, we use 300 KV to do the imaging and the titan, right? And then we, under the two different zone assets right there, 111 and the 001 zone assets, we can clearly see atomic column of metallic lithium right there. I was uh, very, very excited seeing this. And, but the question is, well, you know, how come lithium metal doesn't get damaged? We need to understand the damaging mechanism. So we analyze, Think about heating, you know, beam coming in can heat up your sample. So then under the coil, this helps a lot in the liquid nitrogen temperature. Lithium is metallic. We have this carbon film right there that helps the cooling. So coil really helps. Radiolysis also takes place. Certainly coil would help a lot from the uh, uh, biology, right? The cryo EM, we know this helps a lot as well. In particular, lithium is metallic. I think these, uh, these X bad is reduced. So what about the knock, knock on damage right there? The knock on should be still there. I mean, uh, uh, every time we mention we use 300 KV, people are surprised and say, wow, I mean, you have more knock on damage right there. Turn out to be for metallic lithium, it's a very light element. The knock on mechanism is different from the heavy one. Uh, this is a paper from Ime Ju from Brookhaven National Lab, the simulation. The dashed line is metallic lithium. This is a, how many KVs horizontal axis. This is the knock-on, this, uh, uh, you know, damaging the cross-section right there. Turn out to be for this light element, higher KV, 300 KV is better than low KV, let's say 50 KV or 60 KV right there or 80 KV. So the interaction cross-section for light element is different. If you go to graphite, of course, graphite will be tradition wisdom is telling you higher KV has more damage. That is correct. But for lithium, turn out to be high KV has less damage. This actually helped us in imaging metallic lithium. So with this uh, stability in the cryo condition, the imaging condition, we were ready at the time to answer very, very important question. That is the uh, solid electrolyte interface. This has been a debate. What's the structure in the solid electrolyte interface? This is super important, this SEI layer determines lithium coming in and going out, the rate, right, to a large degree, and also determine the stability, how many cycles your batteries can, can be used, and de determine to some degree of the battery safety as well. And now there's two more, at the time there were two models, mosaic model and layer model. Mosaic model is telling you what is multiple compound, very complex forming this patch pattern mosaic in nature. And the layer model is saying, well, you have the bottom layer close to your end, that's more inorganic, the top layer is more organic species right there. 
So Yu Zhang and Yan Bing went in and did it and say, well, what's the structure right there? Under the cryo condition in, in the Titan a microscope, they were able to resolve metallic lithium dendrite. You see this beautiful layer of surface. This is ever for the first time observed of about 20 nanometer thick. And this uh, ethylene carbonate, uh, diethyl carbonate electrolyte. This consists of inorganic particle like lithium oxide, lithium carbonate embed into amorphous matrix of mostly organics. So this is exciting, sounds like a mosaic model. Then as soon as you add in an additive, a 10% of FEC fluorinated ethylene carbonate molecule in, in the battery industry and in battery research lab, additives are common use to build stable interface to extend your battery life. FEC is a famous molecule. As soon as you add these molecules in, the whole SES structure change. It becomes of this bilayer structure. The bottom layer is more amorphous. The top layer, you see this beautiful inorganic coating. That's lithium oxide. That's just amazing. This is a now multi-layer type of model right there. And, uh, but it's inverse multi-layer. It's different from what people propose. And people propose inorganics in the bottom, organics in the top. We see the reverse, right? It's, uh, it's the opposite. So not only seeing this SCI structure, we were able to correlate what's this SCI structure with the uh, performance of uh, charging and discharging. Uh, the layer model so far give us the battle cycling performance right there. So with this uh, battery demonstration, we were excited and say, so what are the important energy materials so important but atomic scale resolution still challenging? We move on and look at the MOF, metal organic framework. This has a very porous structure, open channel, a lot of gas molecules coming in, ions coming in. It's important for the gas uh, storage, for the catalysis and, and so on. But obtaining this uh, atomic scale resolution is very hard. Uh, obtaining the gas molecule configuration down to atomic scale is also very, very challenging right there. So because this consists of a metal center, metal iron, linked by this organic ligand right there, when I mean, you basically, this is an organic system right there. So it's very fragile under the electron beam. An example is, is the following. Under the total dose of 50 electrons per angstrom square, this is at room temperature. You see the crystallinity of this morph particles, about 100 nanometer in size, disappear very fast, disappear very fast. Direct imaging is very, very challenging. So, and also we want to obtain the host and gas uh, molecules interaction. We need a method to really let the gas molecule to be stabilized inside the TEM. Yu Zhang and uh, uh, Chen two poster with Wa's uh, 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 student Wei Zhang and with uh, Bob's uh, uh, close uh, also uh, supervision, we team up to address this challenge. So this is the idea. This is a famous model called Ziv A with a zinc in there, with organic linker immunodoso in there. And we absorb the gas molecule. We can plunge free under the gas CO2 condition to hypothesis, we can freeze CO2 molecules in there. Now go to the low dose detector. We really now starting to use K2 and K3 type of camera. This is within VAS uh, uh, a cryo EM center using uh, this uh, Titan uh, Creos G2 TEM to do the imaging. So let's look at this uh, morph molecule. This is the one without the CO2, uh, 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 CO2 molecule yet. This is a morph particles, right? You see these are beautiful TM images and you can see very sharp atomic edge right there. This bright stop is spot is the uh, zinc center and linked together by this organic linker. Now seeing this very sharp edge, this allow us now try to understand the growth mechanism of this uh, morph particles is actually the layer by layers, the step edge addition growth mechanism clearly identified. The reason is the step edge growth mechanism probably around the step 
along the, the step edge right there. You can build up adding these uh, zinc. They can be more stable because they are bridging with other zinc center right there. If you have add atoms right there, try to glow up, building up on the top, you know, the binding won't, won't be as stable. So we, through this imaging, because of the stability under the cryo condition, we can obtain the growth mechanism of this moth. So the uh, radiation, understanding the uh, irradiation is very important. The dose testing, for example, this is under cryo condition. We can see, you know, with uh, those 25 electron per angstrom scale, 55 and 90 electron per angstrom square, how this diffraction pattern change? Why well, you pick a diffraction spot and monitor its bright spot, uh, you know, the intensity change. This give us the dose uh, testing. We know and within what range of those we can still obtain the structure, believe not damaged yet. You see now under 90 electron per angstrom square, you know, the crystallinity still largely remain under the cryo condition. If you go to room temperature, it takes only about 10 to 20 electron per angstrom square to damage the sample significantly. 50 electron per angstrom square will completely uh, uh, amorphize these uh, particles at room temperature. So with this understanding, this made us ready to tackle the very exciting problem is to see the CO2 gas molecules inside the morph. So this is an empty morph right there. We pump the vacuum, empty all the solvent. Under the vacuum condition, uh, our students postdoc developed this uh, plunge freeze process, plunge in the vacuum condition. So make sure it's empty. You see this is empty morph right there, right? This is uh, the open channel of the morph. <clears throat> now with CO2. This is a really beautiful CO2 molecule. Now inside this channel, this bright spot right there. So we can see uh, <clears throat> this molecule beautifully sitting in there. So certainly at this moment, we cannot resolve individual carbon oxygen atom yet inside the CO2 molecule. We don't know we will be able to or not because in this moment, we are in not entirely sure whether CO2 will have the fixed orientation and configuration in there. That's for the future study. So with these examples, I also just want to uh, sum summarize, you know, the past uh, three years of uh, research of, uh, you know, for the battery material using cryo EM, this many first time we observe answering the important batteries questions. We see this huge opportunity for morph for hybrid perovskite materials. And, and this is just, uh, you know, the beginning of the cryo-EM for material science and also for energy science. I know in the past, cryo-EM has been explored for material science before. Now it's a new era of using the state of our cryo-EM. It's even more exciting. Uh, I also want you to bring your attention to a cryo EEM's perspective for materials and energy science and also nanoscience. And, and this uh, perspective article together with why we actually summarizing many exciting directions I'd like to encourage you to read about. Uh, let me uh, uh, end my talk by saying the in situ and cryo are important. For the cryo EM down the road, there's a sample preparation needed advanced technique needed to really advance our understanding for the clean energy materials. Uh, let me end my talk really by just thanking my collaborators over the years. And there's uh, many research work I didn't speak about. At Stanford right here, we are establishing a major thrust of uh, using cryo-EM, develop cryo-EM for energy materials with Jen Dayang um, and also uh, uh, Paul McIntyre's involvement together with uh, certainly Y and Bob and, and others in a significant way. Uh, let me thank my research group. There's some people I didn't speak about their work. For example, Jiwen, Raphael, they're helping organizing uh, these uh, EMX symposium. And also uh, <clears throat> there's a few others also like William Huang also contribute quite a lot. Let me thank the Stanford's Nano Share Facility and Stanford Slack Cryo EM Facility and uh, the, the DOE VTL, the Beatrice uh, program, 
uh, to fund the battery part of research and a new create some of the research on the cryo EM. Particularly now uh, for the cryo EM, we are uh, initiated this major research thrust and it's supported by the DOE Base Energy Science Material Science Division. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yi. That was um, an outstanding talk. A reminder for those of you with questions, please post them in the Q&A and I will moderate them. Um, uh, Yi, the, the first question comes from uh, Eva Olson, um, which um, is, can you or do you foresee being able to combine cryo-electron microscopy with uh, dynamic studies uh, using, for example, ETEM or the nano factory holder? So uh, Eva, this is an amazing question. This is uh, one of the dreams <laughs> we would like to have. I think there's a, a, a few ideas right here. How do we do the dynamic study? Uh, one could be like what you uh, uh, just mentioned. And under the cryo condition, uh, if we apply a electrical you know, voltage, can we still induce something is changing? Uh, the difficulty, of course, is in the quiet condition, really nothing is moving, right? So maybe we need to elevate the temperature up a little bit, not necessarily in the liquid nitrogen type of temperature, but still cold enough to let the sample reasonably stable, but still having some dynamic process happening. That could be one approach. Uh, we are not sure yet whether this uh, could be done. The second approach can be you freeze your sample at different time sequence. It needs to be different sample, right? So, and you freeze different matter stable state. And, uh, and then you look at each of the sample. Maybe this also allow you to build up the dynamic information. I, I think that's also a viable mm -hmm. approach. So we are still exploring. We'll be happy to chat more Eva later. <laughs> awesome, thanks Yi. So a combined question from um, Alistair McDowell and uh, Ali Shaikh. Um, how much energy do we need to clean up lithium battery waste? And do you think we'll be able to shift to 100% renewable technologies before 2050? Oh, great question. So, um, so lithium ion batteries uh, needs to be recycled. There's huge effort right now Number one, collect the battery first. I think it's possible for the electric car to collect all the batteries. That's what the lead acid batteries community has been doing. 95% of the lead acid batteries are recycled. They can be recycled, right? Lithium needs to learn how to do it. For portable electronics, we need to encourage people to recycle the batteries from your cell phone, from portable electronics to, to do the recycling. Collection. And then there's huge effort in the United States and Europe as well and everywhere. I, I believe in companies and the government agency to develop the cleaner process to recycle the batteries. Um, that's very important. And then the energy input better coming from renewables. 2050, whether we can go to 100% renew, uh, renewable. Let's see, I, I want to get to 80% instead of 100. 100% might be too, too challenging, but 80% uh, first. Solar and wind coming in, the electricity cost is so low right now. What's missing at this moment is energy storage to integrate this into the electric grid. That's why working on batteries or some other type of energy storage in a larger scale, right, to store solar and wind electricity become important. I think if the whole society is paying attention to, well, US government need to do better job uh, with, uh, you know, our election is coming tomorrow, right? So uh, uh, if government all align, you know, uh, back to the uh, Paris Agreement, you know, and really commit, I think might be possible to go to very deep penetration of renewables. 100%, I'm not mm. sure, but very, very deep is possible. Great, thanks, Yi. Um, let's see, another question from uh, Marcos Lucero. Are there any issues with gases such as nitrogen reacting with lithium during the cryo preparation? And if so, how do you get around those problems? Again, another great question. <laughs> we have great audience right here. So this is a reaction we worry about a lot. If it's a room temperature nitrogen with lithium and it happened right away, within about a few minutes, 
your lithium metal will build up with react with nitrogen, build up cell passivation layer. If the nitrogen having a little bit of water in there, it will just go and completely react. However, in the cryo condition, liquid nitrogen condition, and uh, we check it very carefully, we find out liquid nitrogen does not react with lithium metal. That surface is super clean. Great. All right, <clears throat> the final question, um, uh, which I think might be a nice uh, summary of the talks. What are the key differences between preparing biological specimens for cryo-EM versus some of the nanomaterials for energy, like the MOF structures or the lithium ion battery structures? What would you highlight as the key differences in preparation? So uh, biological sample, you want it to be in, 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 the, in the richer state, right? If you do MOF, uh, uh, MOF might be a little bit easier in terms of how fast you quench your sample, right? And put it in, uh, you are not dealing with the uh, which is ice problem. What you are need to dealing with is a CO2 absorb in there. You need to maintain CO2 pressure. If you look at a mouth, you want something empty, nothing in the mouth. You need to pump vacuum, pump vacuum, and then under the vacuum condition and plant free. So it's slightly different procedure. I, I would say for the batteries down the road, the challenging will be similar as a biological sample. We want to freeze the full batteries with electrolyte all in there and make sure the electrolyte does not crystallize the salt and so on. Then the challenging similar uh, to the biological sample. Cool, thank you. Um, well, thanks Yi for an amazing talk. There are a few more questions, but in the interest of time, uh, it might be best if uh, um, the speakers were to look through or, or later uh, go through the Q&A and uh, respond to any additional questions. I will hand over the floor once again to Bob. Thank you, Jen. Um, nice job. And uh, thank you, Yi, for a brilliant talk. I don't know if uh, Jacques would like to say anything about uh, his impression of this uh, material science work. Needs to unmute. I enjoy very much to feel I know very little. And uh, of course, as, as the, the speaker was saying, um, the, the price of electricity is now very, very low. The best way to produce it is sun or wind, and uh, but the problem of storage remain very important. That's right. So good luck, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, two uh, things, which um, from uh, what Jacques was saying earlier, uh, and from Yi's talk, it's quite clear that uh, for young students uh, pursuing electron microscopy, besides having the microscope itself, then specimen preparation is absolutely critical. And the choice of a good problem, a great problem to solve, is uh, something to think about uh, as you proceed in your uh, research careers. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning. And uh, uh, we, have, uh, we can announce that the next one will be um, on December 7th, Monday, the first Monday of the month. And the speakers uh, will be uh, Jacques, uh, a co-Nobel Prize laureate, uh, Richard Henderson, um, and uh, Professor Francis Ross uh, from MIT, who has pioneered uh, in, in situ liquid cell electron microscopy. So that's an exciting combination for us for next month. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, everyone. And uh, once again, the Ziwen and Raphael for getting this uh, uh, started uh, for uh, Jacques and Yi for fantastic talks and for getting us, uh, us going and uh, yourselves for your participation and interest. We would appreciate feedback. We will have a website set up very soon and any feedback you have or suggestions about how we can uh, modify this or improve it, uh, that would be very uh, useful. You can always e email us directly. Um, or uh, through uh, the website when it's available. So thank you everyone. And uh, let's, uh, let's uh, go forward uh, and, uh, and use electron microscopy to solve uh, critical problems for the future. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Wa and Jen and Professor Dubosche. It's uh, your talk just amazing. <laughs> Learning about the past history. Ziwen, I think we can stop the recording now. Bye. Mm -hmm. Thank Bye. you, everyone.